Hey guys, how you all doing? And ting, and ting, and ting. So, I saw this one here and I was like, hmm, this seems like it's going to be interesting. And it's 100 years on. How do today's loyalist teenagers see their Northern Irish identity? You know what I mean? We hear about all the troubles and all of that, you know. But how do the younger people see it? That's going to be interesting. Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what we're on here. Loyalism. Loyalty to Ulster. Loyalty to Britain. But the thing that trumps them both. Loyalty to neighborhood. And loyalty to friends. Watching the bonfire being built ahead of July the 12th. On the Corcoran estate, ported down. I like British values. It's just sort of my understanding of the way it is. When we talk about Protestant culture, what does that mean to you? Bonfires and bomb parades, orange orders. Well, my nanny and granddad jumped in, that was going to be a price and yeah. told me everything about it. Like, what kind of stories? The stuff that, like, the other side doesn't like. wasn't really that good. Yeah. I don't know they were bad as each other, but just, just grew up with it. But you have Catholic mates, do you? No, it is, yeah. For these young people, loyalism and unionism are at a crossroads post-Brexit and the Northern Irish Protocol. But this crisis is personal, not just political. Debate about the future of the Union and even a shared or united Ireland offends their very sense of themselves. If the Union doesn't survive, what happens to unionism? Yeah. They're just going to take over. They're going to, well, they're going to try to take over. Who are they? The Catholics. Yeah. And the people from the South, they'll just think they're on the place. Yeah. Basically try to run our culture into the ground. Let's imagine a united Ireland in 10 years from now. What would your world be like? I wouldn't like it. I would move away. Like, I would feel under threat all the time walking down the street if it was to turn into United Ireland. Because you feel like that sometimes already. They're just going to steal everything from us, all our freedom. But if, they, if it happens, like, the troubles are more likely to start again. Abbey and Ryan wow. talk about their rights and their culture under siege. A narrative once owned by the Catholic community in Northern Ireland, and rightly so, now echoed by Protestant young people born after the Good Friday Agreement. Could there be a world where you had a united Ireland, but could still have your bonfires and parades? No. I don't think so, no. It'll why, just why turn into so trouble. about that? I don't get it. They want our culture away already. Like, they will come in there, in the here and try burn out a night and stuff. Wow. Even the young people, there's an absolute mistrust of each other. How do we bridge that gap is the question. No, do they did what they when doing this uh video did they did they like emphasize people who feel like that? Comment down below. Do like everybody pretty much have that mistrust of each other because of past history and stuff like that? Or are are people starting to live and let live a little bit, you know what I mean? Is it a possibility that the things like the troubles could happen again and reignite? I know somebody in the comment section says that there's been an uptick in certain uh, uh, issues there. You know, comment down below. It seems like they have lived in a tenuous at best peace. So if there's a tenuous peace, wouldn't it be possible to have a peace that's everlasting without the mistrust and is the mistrust because of history is it because of religion is it politic political or is it the things that are passed down and not just ireland but around the world wouldn't it be more beneficial to okay we don't want okay well, i don't want my culture to be taken they don't want their culture to be taken. Maybe sitting down and talking about the cultures could coexist without one being dominant over the other or without one being thought of as better than the other. But in order to do that, that's something 
we could uh, instill in the younger people that it, it is possible that you know we could live together, have our own beliefs, and, and live in the same society. I mean, people could do that peacefully without one being dominant. Because when one becomes dominant, that means the other is going to rebel, which will cause more trouble. And a lot of people is going to tell me, you know, but you just don't understand what's going on there. And they might be right, but I also understand how it is to feel a certain way, being a person of color living here where there is a racial divide. And of course, there's a tenuous kind of a peace that we live in. The thing about it is, though, once you get to know people on a personal level, those things seem to disappear until somebody else come up and say, hey, well, those people are like that, or those people are like that. Or leaders give people the impression that the others are trying to take over, kind of like with the LGBT thing here when they're asking for equal rights. But yet people are saying they want power or black people they want power and not equality now if they spin that sort of a narrative then sooner or later those people are going to say well the only way we could get equality is if we get the power which seems like it's a natural progression of thinking if i can't have the equality then give me the power Let's get back to this here. As unpalatable as it sounds, some of the young loyalists we spoke to saw the riots a few weeks ago as kids fighting for the future of their country. The perception that Catholic nationalists and republicans are getting everything and getting away with everything is loyalism's rocket fuel. A lot of these kids are just so bored and whether you like it or not, a riot is exciting, and especially for a, for a young sort of teenager. Along with his mates, Joel Keyes is gathering wood in a forest outside Belfast for their bonfire in July. The 19-year-old was arrested during the riots in Belfast, released without charge, and is on bail. So I went down to see what was going on, and I saw someone that I know. Um, he's, he's a young fella. He's not a bad person at all says he tried to help his 13 year old friend joel wasn't involved in the violence itself the riots started some people asking though perhaps even in downing street what's loyalism again loyalist pretty much nowadays is it's a term that's used to describe paramilitaries and criminals um and, and that's not at all what loyalism is it's not what loyalists are i, I don't think you can be a, a, a criminal. what does it mean to you I like British, or what I perceive to be British ideals, British values. Um, but there's something about British values that's yeah. kind of knitted into your person and your sense of yourself. Definitely. There are lots of different interests fighting over loyalism. So, for Joel, the young people writing was a symptom of that struggle. But at the minute, all they are being told and all they are getting answers from is fighting. You know, we have all this media attention, and what does it come from? the fights. Um, it hasn't come from our politicians, it hasn't come from community representatives, it has come from the fighting and, and that tells people that fighting works and what they need is to be presented with an alternative um, and this is what we want, this is how we're going to get it, let's work on it together. There is no place in the politics, we can't just leave them to it. We can't just say to them, all right, we'll back off and let you handle it, we trust you. That confidence is gone. We need a roadmap. We need people to be included in that process, and we need real political goals. In Northern Ireland, loyalism's story is painted on the walls, carefully crafted, monumental. At Lanark Gate in Belfast, where the rioting happened, though, there are also crude, sad footnotes telling other stories, too. Paul Gabay reporting, and Sir Geoffrey Donaldson has confirmed that he's entering the race for the Democratic Unionist Party leadership. His decision to run means that the DUP will be holding the first leadership contest in its 50-year history after Arlene Foster announced her resignation last week. So Geoffrey will take on the current Northern Ireland Agriculture Minister, Edwin Poots. 
Today, Northern Ireland enters its second century. I am convinced that in this new century, Northern Ireland's best days are ahead of us. We want to build a shared future. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't t trust party tricksters. I just don't trust them. You cannot trust their motives for doing anything. And I'm talking about anywhere in the world. You just can't. And for me, anywhere in this world, if a politician will come up and say he's doing this for the human race, but he's trying to say he's doing it for a specific section of the human race, a specific nationality of the human race, a specific color of the human race, then no, I don't trust him. Because if he's doing it for a specific sector, how are we going to have peace with everybody else? Because that specific sector is just going to want to want power. And I'm looking at it across the board. I'm not looking at it from a Northern Irish or an, Ir or, or an Irish perspective. I'm looking at it from across the board, across the world. When religions and the, the leaders saying we know best and we could conquer, you know what I mean? And we, we need to make the world this way. To make it safe. Polytricksters say that all the time. But it's to make who safe? Because a lot of polytricksters, kids don't go off to war. It's ordinary kids that go off to war. While the polytricksters, kids move up in society and thing and have stuff. And then these kids come back and have nothing. And this is a, all over the world this is happening. So it's for the betterment of whom? Is there really peace if every day you have to worry about how you pay your bills? Is there really peace if every day you have to worry about getting mugged or shot? And the reality is it doesn't happen as prevalent as people say it does. Polytricksters use that as a political tool to get, you know, I will stop this from happening, I'll stop crime. There's a war on drugs, there's a war on immigration, there's a war on this. It's all a, 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 a ploy, in my estimation, to get people to vote for them. Because if they vote for them, they have the power. They have the power. And they're pretty much well protected, too. Like recently they were talking about a government shutdown here, right? Who's going to suffer during this government shutdown? The everyday working person. That's who is not going to get paid. They are going to get paid whether the government shut down or not. So who, who, who is getting taken care of? Didn't they, didn't they get voted in to take care of the people regardless of what's happening? So the people should be taken care of if there's in a shutdown, but they're not. They're going to get punished while people try to get their agenda in. And if their agenda, and usually their agenda is to maintain their own power, I'm sorry, that's how I feel, that's what I'm seeing. It's not for the betterment of the people. Every single year there's a, there's a, every four years, it's the same issue. How can you not fix the issue? It's like from the whole lifetime that I've lived, that I've been around, it's the same issue every single time. How come it's not fixed? Because nobody's trying to really fix it. It's just a hotbed issue to run on every election cycle. And it's usually nothing that's going to help the people. Wages are stagnant. And I'm assuming it's like all over the world. People are working from paycheck to paycheck all over the world. And every time a politician come in, they say they won't fix it, but it never gets fixed. It just goes to another election cycle when they use it so that people can go, he, this one's going to do it. Oh, this one's going to do it. Oh, he says he's going to do it. Oh, he's for the people. And nothing ever gets done. Really. People are always uh, blaming the, the current president or prime minister for the economic situation. And sometimes there's, a, there's absolute reason why. And you could tell. But a lot of the times it's, man, you were struggling under that one. And you were struggling on the one before. And you were struggling on the one before that. And still nothing ain't changing. So tell me why that is. People are working from paycheck to paycheck, from prime minister to prime minister, from different party to different party. 
Why is that? If you, you know, vote people in to fix stuff, but it's the same issue every four years or every two years or when you're holding the holy election, what are they really doing to fix it? Pay attention to the issues that they put into the forefront. The real issues aren't being put to the forefront. It's cultural issues that are being put to the forefront these days mainly. And of course, too, I'm speaking from the perspective of where I am. Tell me how it is where you are. Hit me up in the comment section. For everyone in Northern Ireland, where we can all, regardless of our background, have a part to play in showing the world what we are truly capable of. Well, we're joined now by the political commentator, Sarah Crichton. Sarah, thanks very much for coming on our programme. Tell me about the power struggle in the DUP. Is the party heading in a more hardline direction or is that a wrong assumption? I think that the fear at the moment is that it is going to go in a hardline direction. Um, Edwin Peets and Geoffrey Donaldson are very different uh, people within the DUP. They also represent different factions within the DUP. Edwin Poots would be from the much more conservative wing. I mean, Geoffrey Donaldson is conservative as well, but he would be seen as a moderate within that party. And I mean a DUP moderate, um, not a moderate in the sense maybe the GNI would know or speak of. Um, but certainly there is a concern that the DUP is maybe going to regress back into its fundamentalist roots. Um, Edwin Poots um, quite recently boycotted a North-South ministerial meeting, for instance. There's a concern that if he, if he became the party leader or deep first minister, um, that, that he would maybe take them down a much more um, obstructionist uh, path, that he a much more aggressive path. And for many people who, who are concerned about unionism, they don't think that is going to be conducive to the, the future of the union or indeed Northern Ireland's future. It's really fascinating listening to the voices in Porrick O'Brien's piece. I mean, the, amongst those young voices, there seems to be a really serious existential crisis going on about their future, how they, they see their future and their values assured in the union. Absolutely. And, I, you know, I think those young people, they articulated themselves very well. You know, I may not agree with everything that they said, uh, but I think for a lot of these young people, they are very concerned about their future, about the future of Northern Ireland. They care about that very passionately. Um, I don't agree, you know, that if United Ireland happened, that the unionism would be would be downtrodden and it would be treated badly. But I think the concern that their culture would not be respected is very genuine and it comes from from uh, from a very genuine place. And certainly for them looking at the protocol, looking at Brexit and with the violence and that disconnect with their politicians, that sense that their politicians are not representing them. Um, they feel these things very strongly and there's quite clearly a desire there for their, for their concerns to be, to be heard by those in power. And there's a, a, a real problem here that their, their social and cultural values might actually be more in tune with the social and cultural values of young people in the Republic of Ireland and not so much with you know, people like you know, those running for the DUP leadership at the moment. Um, within unionism, and I think there's a huge distinction between political unionism and, and civic unionism and indeed civic loyalism as well. Um, you know, young unionists and Protestants for Northern Ireland have always been much more socially progressive than their politicians. And, you know, statistics show that, you know, quite a significant number of young unionists don't actually vote for unionist parties. So I would say that the concerns that they feel um, really are connected to young people across these islands, not just within Britain, but within, within the Republic as well. I think there's a real desire within unions communities for more progressive social change. You know, the communities that you, those young people came from are often suffering from social deprivation. I think there's a real um, push within those communities for... No, I'll be honest with you. When I started watching this, I thought we would hear more from the young people. I didn't expect an analysis of how they feel. I wanted a, a, a succinct understanding of how they feel, so I wanted them to talk to the young people more. Not, you know what I mean? That's what I was hoping for out of this year, you know what I mean? And that's the problem I have with a lot of new stuff. And like the kids said, they don't talk to people unless there's some kind of violence happening. It has to come to that before they say, well, what is going on here? And then they sort of uh, mask it within, a, within a, a political thing and not take into consideration the emotion of the people that's having this situation, go on with them. And everybody's got, to a certain degree, legitimate concerns. Hey, I want to maintain my culture. And I want to know who is in power is not going to try to affect my culture to make theirs the dominant culture from both sides, not just from one side. 
I think it's good to do analytic looks at situations. But the dude, the kid that spoke was so eloquent in what he said. There's obviously young people who could speak eloquently about how they feel and what they, they you know, what they need to go forward. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the thing about it is too, when you're organized, regardless of what side you're on, the other side is going to say, oh, that's a rebel, that's a subversive. You know what I'm saying? And even if you try to organize together, they're gonna look at you as a, as being, you know, a problem. And because people pick sides so much, they listen to the poly tricksters that say, you know, there must be a problem. What are they doing there? Instead of listening to the people who have a voice to say that something is going on here and what are we gonna to do to fix it? And politicians do that because they want to maintain power. Once again, I'm speaking for my own surroundings and what I'm seeing. Comment down below if you tell me and tell me if you think that's what's happening where you are. Better features to, to fight against poverty and, and other social issues. And finally, if the problem of progressive unionism you know, of finding a voice in politics for those people isn't solved, does that make, you know, ultimately, further down the road, the end of the union more likely? I think it's, it's difficult to say, but certainly I think that if unionism does not connect with those young people, but does not connect within progressive, um, socially progressive unionists and unionists on the left or liberals, I do think there is there is a danger that for many people um, within Northern Ireland who are persuadable, so unionists who maybe do think they might consider United Ireland, and, and obviously United Ireland um, obviously has is was a conservative country, but obviously it has it has progressed on abortion and equal marriage. There is a concern that people might think the constitutional change is the only way to bring about change within Northern Ireland, and I think that is a real concern for unionism. And I think if it doesn't um, tap into that, if it doesn't listen, if they don't listen to those voices, I do think there could be potential trouble further down the line. Interesting, Sarah Crichton. Thank you very much indeed. That was quite interesting there. At some point, we, the people, have to say, hey, screw the politicians. I'm going to cross them lines and talk to that, them there. See if I can make friends with them. Hopefully, they're not, they're not so indoctrinated that they're going to want to kill me or uh, meme me or something like that. Let's go. Let's go. You know what I mean? Obviously, governments ain't going to fix nothing. Poly, well, I don't say governments. Politics ain't going to fix nothing. They're just trying to get elected. My opinion, of course, my opinion the way I see how far off they are from each other, deliberately, far off they are from each other, the point is they have no intentions of uniting anybody, and that's anywhere in the world. They have no intentions, because if they unite the people, somebody's going to lose power, because then the people would have the power because the people sat down and said, hey, my brethren across them, my fellow human being, What's going on? Let's talk about this. Naive. Somebody told me once I'm looking for utopia. But there's no such thing. There's no such thing as utopia. We barely get along with Mother Nature. There's hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes. You know, New York has been flooding the last few days. So no. Humans cannot have utopia because Mother Nature, we can't, we can't talk Mother Nature out of a hurricane. But we could talk each other out of violence because we have the capacity to communicate. My humble opinion, maybe my naive opinion, but that's the way I think, you know what I mean? I have, I've seen a lot of troubles and stuff in my life, encountered a lot of stuff. And at this point in my life, I just want to sit down and talk to people and see, hey, what's up? What's going on? What's the deal? You understand what I'm saying? I hope you guys found this interesting. I'm going to leave a link to this video in the description. I hope you guys are having a good day. Take care of each other, all right? Pool runnings.